Uh, it's nice to come and uh, pray with everybody and, and take your blessing. It's always a, a blessing to see Abuna David and Abuna Daniel, um, two very good friends. Um, so I thought I'd talk instead of Monday specifically, just to kind of talk about Holy Week in general. Uh, so Holy Week is an interesting week. You see a lot of black. We hear a lot of sad tunes. We don't greet each other after a certain time. We do lots of matanyas in the morning. We fast very strictly. And the question is, why are we so sad? Um, of course, the church never feels sorry for Jesus. Uh, it's quite the opposite, right? On the day of the cross, Christ said, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Um, and I'm always struck by the incessant um, chanting of thine is the power, just keep saying it over and over again. Um, I noticed you guys don't have one here, but usually there's an icon of the crucifixion here. And we're saying thine is the power. We're saying thine is the power um, to an icon of a man being crucified, a man dying. And I wonder if someone came in from the outside they think we're nuts. You know, they like you're just incessantly chanting, Thine is the power to a man who's dying to death. And that's kind of the concept, this power of death. Um, is that really a thing? Does death have a power? Um, it does in his death, the Lord's death, is different than the other. And St. Paul says in Thessalonians, and the dead in Christ will rise. The dead in Christ will rise. And we say his death is life-giving. So there's something about his death, his crucifixion, that's different. Holy Week starts with Lazarus' death and resurrection and ends with Christ's death and resurrection. And the very first gospel we read in the very first hour, in the very first night, last night, Palms and uh, Eve of Monday. This is a beautiful part from John chapter 12. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And that's the first thing the church reads to us. It's about the kernel. It's about the grain of wheat that falls and dies. And it has to die in order to produce many seeds. So is death a good thing or a bad thing? I know we cry when people around us die. It doesn't feel right. It actually doesn't feel natural, oddly enough. Death doesn't feel natural. And there's been a lot of death this year. I'm sure many of us have experienced relatives, ones, people we love or people we know um, that have passed away with everything that's happened. And, and COVID, I think, has revealed to us a tremendous fear fear of death. We see it in the way people acted and reacted. We see it in, in the way they, they treated the situation. There was fear, a real fear, and it was a fear of dying. I don't want to die. This verse from Thessalonians says, as well, it says, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. So you do not, so you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. So those who have slept in death, St. Paul's saying, don't grieve like the rest of the people who have no hope. Our hope is different in the, those who've rested, sleep in death. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. So our faith is different, isn't it? And much of Monday's readings, today's readings, are about, this morning, were about death. The death of Adam, the, the story of the creation, the story of how Adam fell, how God said, death, you shall surely die if you eat of this thing. And of course they did. But ultimately, death is foreign to us. You know, in the liturgy, we say death, which entered the world through the envy of the devil. Death is not part of the plan. Yeah, that's why it feels weird. And so I wonder sometimes, do we actually fear death or do we fear what's beyond death? Because death is kind of painless, isn't it? Just dead. So that's not really the fear, is it? It's what's beyond death is usually what's gripping me, what's terrifying me. And so we should use death 
as a smelling salt. You know, smelling salt when someone's unconscious and you should barely breathing, you put these horrendously smelling salts underneath their nose and they they stink so they wake up. And that's what death should be. It should be a smelling salt. So we put it underneath our nose uh, and it awakens us from the false belief that we're going to live forever. Right? This is especially useful at funerals and it's especially useful during Holy Week. And this threat and fear of death can rob us of joy. It can paralyze us. You know, imagine for a moment someone comes in to rob your house and he ties you down. I know there's lots of kids here. I didn't realize there's this big so many kids here. I put this together, but um, maybe I should skip the story. <laughs> I'll skip that story. Okay. So the fear of death can take away our joy. And there are people who are paralyzed by it. And we live our whole lives with this hanging over our heads. In fact, humans are the few animals that actually are very aware that they are going to die, right? Most animals are just, they're instinctual. They don't really think, I live about, you know, I'm a cat. I live about 11 years. It's been about nine. I got about two left. Doesn't come, you know, on the, on the mind of a cat, right? So humans, you know, we know we've got about 74.5 years, right? I'm at, you know, 73 now. So, you know, I'll just do the math. Um, and people deal with it differently. Um, some choose not to talk about it. Some don't go to funerals. Some occupy themselves incessantly, keep themselves very busy, keep themselves drunk, keep themselves high, work a lot. Some get very healthy so they can somehow avoid death. Some never really live because of it. You know, like, what's the point? We're all gonna die anyway. And then some try to live too much. Right, the opposite. When they say things like YOLO, right, the young people say YOLO. You only live once, right? And you know, I saw once a bumper sticker that said, "Whoever dies with the most toys wins," right? Which is just sad. But you know, this person just out of, and he's on a big, really fancy car, right? Some big fat Mercedes. So, but I want to think the way Saint Paul thinks, right? When he says, "Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting?" I love that, right? I kind of want to have. I want to have what Saint Paul's had. Of death, where is your victory? Of death, where is your sting? He sees the death, and it has no victory, and it has no sting, and he has no fear. Right? And this ultimately is the way a Christian has to live. He too shared in our humanity so that by his death, he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. This is from Hebrew, Hebrews. He may break the power of him who holds the power of death. And he continues, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Held in slavery by their fear of death. I saw a lot of that during COVID. A lot of fear, real fear. This morning, Jesus says, most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my words, he shall never see death. And so this contrast is tremendous, right? Here we are, we, we walk into the church, we look at this icon of this crucifixion and all we say, thine is the power. And over and over, we start talking about death. Right in the beginning, if the grain of wheat doesn't fall and dies, it bears no fruit. In fact, the, the icon of Gal David and Goliath is often found next to the crucifixion in some churches, in our church, in other churches. So why? Why is the icon of David and Goliath next to the crucifixion? doesn't make much sense. Until you think about Goliath never faced a man he didn't kill. Up until that moment, he never faced a man that he didn't kill. Until he faced David. And then David did what? David killed him. The first man ever to kill Goliath, obviously. The first man Goliath didn't kill. And who's David? What do we say? What do we say on Palm Sunday? Hosanna to the son of David. Right? So David's Christ. And who's Goliath? It's death. He is the unconquerable foe, the foe who's never lost, who takes every man who he faces. And then Christ faces him, and he does what? Conquers death by death tramples death by death in other translations. So 
So let's go back to Lazarus. So we know Lazarus died twice. That kind of sucks. So having already gone through it the first time and knowing the full capability of Christ, how do you think he felt the second time? Do you think he was even scared laying on his deathbed? I imagine he didn't have a fear in the world. He's just like, bro, I got this. Right? It's like walking into a courthouse and you'll be judged, you know, trial, but you have a signed pardon from the governor in your back pocket. You're like, yeah, judge could say whatever. I'm just going to take out this signed pardon and I'm going to say, I'm throw it in his face and say, I'm going to walk free now. And so you already know the outcome. You already know how this is going to end, right? Even though you're still going into the trial, you know what's going to happen, right? Because you've been there before. And so to summarize, I think Lazarus is feeling, you know, and if we had to say it, we'd say he already died. He already died. And that experience gave him tremendous strength and confidence, right? I've already died. So Lazarus wasn't scared of his second death. It wasn't a scary thing. I imagine him closing his eyes with a big smile on his face and saying, here we go again. Right? So why is he not scared of death? Because he already died. So how do we do that? How do we get what Lazarus had? We die as well. We die with Christ, and we die with Christ over and over again. Starting in baptism, right? In the Romans, we, we read, Oh, aren't you aware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead for the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. For, we, for if we have been united with him, like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. So it starts with baptism, but then death continues, doesn't it, through life? I asked someone, I asked one of the youth recently, I said, how's Lent? You know what he said? He said it was really hard. He said it killed me. I love that expression. He said, that's perfect. That's exactly what it should have done. Right? That's, the, that's the perfect answer to what Lent should do to us. You see, so the, the key to dying like Lazarus with a big smile on the face is death with Christ first. And I want to read you just a couple of verses from St. Paul. It's not because I'm from the Church of St. Paul. I just like St. Paul. Knowing this, these are from Romans, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, also in Romans, just as it is written, just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We are being put to death all day long. This is the, the kids and the school and the work and the family and the service and the relatives and, the, and the, all the stuff that we have. We are considered a sheep led to slaughter. Corinthians, for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Paul loves to talk about the cross. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Constantly putting the cross and Christ in our lives. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees? For if we died with him, we also live with him. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Have you seen a pattern? So St. Paul over and over and over again, talking about this death with Christ, crucified with Christ, dying all the time. This is what life is. Lent is a big part of that. All right, so let's bring it back to Holy Week so you guys can go home. Holy Week starts on a high and ends on a high. It begins with glory. He raises Lazarus from the dead. He comes in Palm Sunday triumphantly. Everyone's saying Hosanna. We're singing Shanini. Everybody's happy. And then it ends on a high. We have the resurrection. New beginning for mankind. But in the middle, it gets kind of rough, right? I imagine it's kind of like an upside-down bell. You know, it's like starts high, starts high, and then it just dips in the middle, right? Wednesday's probably the low point where his own 
disciple sells him out. And then it, you know, comes up. And so, in this way, Holy Week, the reason we make such a big deal about Holy Week is it kind of mirrors our whole life, our physical life as Christians, doesn't it? We're baptized as babies. Christ comes into us triumphantly. And then we live, we rejoice a bit, we suffer a bit, and then we die. And then we're resurrected at the second coming. This is our life. We're baptized, we live, we die, we're resurrected. A lot like Holy Week. That's our physical life, but can it mirror our spiritual life? Can Holy Week look like a spiritual life? Our own spiritual birth and death and resurrection cycle. So the Father teaches that this week penetrates all aspects of our salvation. And I want to look at the cycle as a spiritual person, as a, in a spiritual life. I bring Christ in as a king. This choice of bringing Christ in assures me of something. It assures me of struggle. We see Christ during this week, a lot of struggle. The disciples leave him, lots of problems. All week he has problems, lots of loneliness, lots of misunderstanding, lots of torment. This is life. And then after we struggle, some part of us dies. Some part of our ego dies. And this happens a lot. And this leads to the victory. This leads to the resurrection. And then it starts over again. And so our spiritual life is a lot like that. We bring Christ in and we say, come on into our life. And as soon as we do, the bad things start happening. The trials come. The temptations come, the work comes, the death to myself, the crucifying myself, all the verses that we just read with St. Paul. And then part of me dies. And when it does, I resurrect. And then it starts over. And this cycle happened in a week in Christ's life. But could it be shorter than a week? Could it be a day where this morning I wake up and I'm going to say, I'm going to bring in Christ? And then trials happen, and then a part of me dies, and then I resurrect, and the next day I do it over? Sure. Could it be an hour? Could it be a minute? Could it be a second? Can all that happen that quickly? Some of the fathers say that the Jesus prayer is all of Holy Week in one week. I bring Christ in, I feel temptation, some part of me dies, and I resurrect. And that becomes the spiritual life. That's the spiritual pattern. I bring Christ in. I feel temptation. A part of me dies. I resurrect. Start over. And then he comes into a different part of my life. I'm always aware of going too long. So I, I try to like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to shorten stuff. I wrote like 700 pages for some reason. And so this cycle of life and death is actually found in nature. Isn't it? God teaches us through even nature. He says, you know, look at the trees. They have to die. And then they come back in spring. And then the fruits come. And Christ took on all these consequences from the fall. We talked about death. But he took on many other things, didn't he? The second Adam. He took nakedness on the cross. The thorns that were on the ground after the story in Genesis, he took those thorns and he put them on his head. He took the, the shame of Adam and he took Adam's death. And then he conquered all of them. And he says, if you unite with me, then we'll conquer all of them together. And so this is the point of our life. We share with Christ in all of the things that he went through. We unite with him and we share with him and we're victorious with him. And this is, the, this is the kind of unification that Christ wants. He isn't looking for a unification of um, systems, of rituals, of habits. 
is looking for a unification of love, a real unification of love, kind of like a, a crazy mad love. Right? Just this morning, we we're reading a spirit of fornic fornication is in them, in the prophets. We read that Israel was out a whoring. That I won't translate. Right? What's, what's Christ talking about? He's saying, look, we're supposed to be married and you're cheating on me. In the, in the 11th hour, the Proverbs talk about an adulteress for the anger of her husband is full of jealousy. Why is the church reading this thing? What does it mean? He's looking for that kind of relationship, right? That don't cheat on me relationship. That crazy love kind of relationship. Elder Proforio says, if you are in love, you can live in the center of the city and not be aware of the hustle and bustle of the city. You see neither cars, nor people, nor anything else. Within yourself, you are with the person you love. You experience her, take her in delight. She inspires you. Imagine that the person you love is Christ. Christ is in your mind. Christ is in your heart. Christ is in your whole being. Christ is everywhere. And this is the relationship that the church is calling us to. This kind of relationship. So what happens when Christ comes in? I just want to focus on that and then we'll, we'll move on. When Christ came into Palm Sunday, everybody was out, right? Because there was a king coming. And you know, I don't know if you know, but back in the day, they used to pay people to line the streets when the king came in, right? And you never know. You showed up, right? Because people would throw money like the handlers of the king would like hand people some food or hand them some money, right? So you never know what you're going to get. It's kind of like a Cracker Jack box, for those of you who know what that is, right? So there's always some secret toy surprise in the, in, that, that people got who were lying along the route. And so people were wondering, what are we going to get from this Christ guy? Maybe he's going to give us something. Maybe he's going to give us food, right? Maybe they're going to hand out money. Maybe the disciples are going to throw some gold coins at us. Who knows? So they all stood there. Maybe they thought, I'm going to get a blessing. Maybe he's going to heal my kid. Maybe, you know, my, my arm that's been hurting, he's going to touch it and he's going to heal my arm. So they all showed up wanting to get something from Christ. And they were saying, Hosanna, this guy's going to be great. This guy's going to free us from the Jews. This guy's going to do all the great things. And what did Christ do when he entered the temple? We read about it all this morning. What did he do? He flipped tables. He flipped tables. Is that expected? Not at all. I mean, think about it. What do you think they expected him to do with the money on the tables? Based on the assumption of what kind of king he was. They were just saying, Osana to the son of David. So what if the story ends differently? What if the story ends that Jesus walked into the temple, touched the tables, and the money tripled? Would anyone be surprised? No, right? Isn't that, I wouldn't be shocked at all. That's the same story as the five loaves and the two fish. That's the same story of turning water into wine. It's the same story. If he had just walked up and touched all the tables and the money tripled and everyone, hey, Hosanna to the son of David, everybody would be so excited. But he didn't do that, right? He flipped the tables. And it teaches us something very important. When Christ comes into our life, he flips tables. And you have to be prepared to have a table or two or 10 flipped. Something material, something worldly, something earthly, something lustfully, something carnally, something physically. Christ comes in and when he comes into your life, he flips the table. And this is the, this is the deal, right? But what he gives in return is always far greater than that. And so the kingdom of Christ, you know, we say this really long hymn on Good Friday. You know, it's the hymn, Thick and Thorns. It's really long. Why is it really long? Because we say that it's a psalm, and the psalm is, your throne is forever and ever. And imagine that we say that the cross is a throne. Imagine what kind of king has a throne on a cross. Cross is a painful place, right? Hurts, not pleasant. Death. And that's his throne. So what kind of king is this? 
what kind of kingdom is this? And if he's your king and your king is on a cross, what do you expect? You expect a throne? You're part of Christ. You're one of his disciples. You're a Christian. And yet we walk into Christianity thinking, I'm ready for my throne. I do the, the good things. I, I go to the church and then God gives me good children. They go to medical school. I get a Mercedes. All the right things happen. But then we join this Christ and he says, my kingdom, my throne is a cross. Where's your throne? It's also a cross. What kind of kingdom is this anyway? What are we signing up for? We're signing up for the cross. But in that cross is the conquering of death. And bringing it back to Lazarus, this is how we die with Christ. And this is how we don't fear death. And this is why we as Christians have no fear. As St. Paul says, death, where is your sting? Death, where is your victory? May the Lord guide us during Holy Week um, and show us his love, his inebriating love, uh, as we start to focus on him and him alone uh, and wait for the glorious resurrection. Glory be to God forever. Amen.